Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat number 81, featuring the third and final segment of my interview with the computer games pioneer, Mr. Scott Adams. I was just barely able to coax this into 15 minutes, so we've got to jump right into it. So without further ado, here is Mr. Scott Adams. Going back to this original lineup of uh, the Adve Adventure International games, I was wondering, I mean, there's a huge scope of games. There are a lot of different topics, themes. Uh, do you have a favorite? I enjoyed my adventure games, of course, because I had fun writing them, but I didn't play them. Of all the games that we were selling, none of them really were something that I would I spent much time myself playing. Um, I did enjoy, though, uh, games like, oh, Temple of Apshai, and, uh, oh, I'm trying to remember some of the other ones. There were early RPG games Wizardry. that I... Wizardry. Oh, yes, Wizardry. I must have spent... Uh, a couple of weeks uh, of very unproductive time just, quote, analyzing the game for the company <laughs> just to see what it was about. Yes, wizardry, definitely. That was just, just a great deal of fun. Um, today, it, you see its uh, great-grandchildren and things like uh, WoW and EverQuest 2 and so forth. But it was, it, it was amazing back then seeing it come out on these small computers. And this is where the computers shown. The consoles they couldn't hold a candle to what a computer could do. And even today with Xbox 360s and PS3s, a modern, up-to-date computer is still going to have a much better platform than the uh, standard consoles. For example, I've been playing Dragon's Age. Uh, probably aware of that one. I have, um, I think the last time I looked, it said I had 185 days into the game. I know that sounds ridiculous because there's only supposed to be 60 hours of content in there. But I do every side quest, and I love micromanaging every fight and just exploring the world. And the developers did a wonderful job making a very interesting world that was big and huge without feeling sterile. So kudos to them. One thing I, was, I thought was really interesting about the, uh, you know, the adventure games was that the introduction of graphics in the later ones. And I noticed in the ones that I, I just downloaded some from your, from your website, and they were uh, the text-only versions. I'm sort of wondering, how did you feel about those graphics? Do you think they just detracted from the games? or were... I, well, It made it harder to develop because one of the problems with graphics, and I got this a lot and I still get it from fans saying, when we played the text-only version, I couldn't believe how vivid I saw the world. But when they saw a, text, a graphics version, it seemed so much plainer and duller. Uh, the mind's eye is a far better, far better palette than uh, than any artist can do. Um, also, one of the problems with having graphics is then if you're trying to hide things from the player, make them think, and it's sitting there and staring them in the face in the picture, that kind of ruins it. And then vice versa, you may have to put things in the picture that you have no intention of putting in the game, but now you have to do it. So um, it makes makes adventure writing harder or interactive fiction harder to to uh, to have pictures associated with it. I was just thinking originally the um, first graphic adventures go back to um, Ken and Roberta Williams. I remember they did the very first one. Ken originally started off as working for my company. He was a uh, um, distributor in California who would go around to the larger places to try to get our stuff placed. His wife, Roberta, said, you know, I'd like to try writing a, a game. And he said, well, okay. And he supported her in that. And that's, that's where uh, uh, the, the company grew out of, uh, which later became Sierra, Sierra Line, Online, and so forth, which was kind of interesting. I, but I do remember the very first time I saw the, the graphics in the game and thought, well, that's interesting, but that's going to be harder to write the game around. And indeed it was. <laughs> Did you feel pressured at that point to put graphics in your games? Not in the beginning, but later, yeah. Um, King's Quest certainly was putting more pressure there because the King's Quest was very popular. And that, of course, had the full-color graphics. One downside was it didn't port very well to all the different computers, but on the upside, on the computer that's 
that was supporting it, it looked very good. So it certainly was more, more popular. Uh, your wife. <laughs> I was sort of curious that she's accredited for a couple of games too, right? And uh huh. That was Alexis. She wanted to also try writing a story. Um, the first one that she really got into was uh, Voodoo Castle, and then later, I'm trying to remember what the other one was. There's two that she did. Basically, she was able to get part way and then started to flounder, and I had to lend editorial help, as it were, and finish the games off. I read a story on one of the interviews about. You took some of the, your discs, your master discs, yes. stuck them mm -hmm. in the oven. <laughs> what was going yep. on? Yep, <laughs> she, she got a little jealous with the amount of time I was spending with the computer and, and not with her. Came home one day and she says, well, I burnt all your discs. You did what? <laughs> yep, they're all in the oven. No, no. Well, I haven't actually turned it on yet. This is how it's going to be if you don't want me to turn it on. <laughs> and that's when she became an intricate part of the company. <laughs> how did you end up working with Marvel? They called me. Uh, um, Joe Calamari, who was the vice president at the time, uh, decided he wanted to get into computer games with the Marvel licenses, and we were selected as the company to approach. It was really a great honor. Um, and uh, of all the companies I ever worked with, that, that was just one of the most awesome experiences. Uh, worked with Joe Calamari. At the time, Jim Shooter was the editor. Um, I'm trying to remember who the artists were. I worked with a number of very famous artists, and now the name's escaping me. I wrote a, a series of games for them um, where I did the plot outlines. They um, then did the uh, artwork and built the comics around them. Uh, when the f one of the first issues came out, I got Jim Shooter and the rest of the staff to autograph it, and then I met Stan Lee and got him also to autograph that copy too, which was just tremendous fun. Were you a comic um, book fan at the time? I was. Uh, part of my deal with Marvel was that if I was going to write their games, then I wanted to to research. And they said, okay, that's fine. I said, well, I'd like to get all the copies of your comics. And they said, okay, we can give you two or three. I said, no, I'd like a subscription to every comic you have. They said, well, you don't, that's a lot of comics. I said, that's okay. And actually, the uh, months that I was working on Marvel, I literally was reading. I had a stack of comics. Whoa, this tall, sitting on top of my monitor. And I'd take one down and read it between compiles and everything. And I literally read their entire line and kept up with every comic during that period, and uh, it was a lot of fun. Okay, so one other thing I want to talk to you, just to get back to it, uh, the adventure game, uh, the structure of them. You know, a lot of people complain about they get stuck too easily, and I've read some of your interviews where you're talking about how hard it is. You want to give enough clues, but on the other hand, you don't want to give it away. So, you know, looking back, do you have uh, advice for people trying to write adventure games today, how to avoid this problem? One of the things that I found extremely useful is layers of playtesting. Uh, it's good to have veteran playtesters. It's also good to have uh, playtesters with people who have, haven't a clue or have never played a, a game like that. So having a, a, a nice mix. Uh, I've spent a lot of time watching over a playtester's shoulder or uh, reading the log files that came out of their playtest later. Uh, that to give me an idea of how people think, what they're doing, and trying to use as many different uh, playtesters as possible. So that's that's the key that I think works the best. Is there a particular puzzle from any of your games that you're, you're particularly proud of? Um, every game I tried to do something different that I hadn't done each game before that, and I leave it up to the the players to figure out what's different if they ever want to go analyze my series. Um, but I think as the near the end, the neatest thing I did was when I was doing Marvel, which was the last major game that I did, uh, was the Torch and Thing. And you actually got to play both players and you had to play them separately and at different times to solve the adventure. And uh, you were under total control of when you switched back and forth between them. So. Uh, each game as I wrote it I thought was my best game. <laughs> did you ever have a game that after it came out you thought, oh no, I can't believe I did that? <laughs> um, spelling errors. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, there I had no online spell checker and I made numerous spelling errors that I can still see today when I go back and look at them. Oh, 
Can't believe I did that. <laughs> you notice any shift in the culture of gaming and gamers over the years? I, know, I think Roberta Williams made a comment one time that she thought the dumb, uh, gamers just got dumber and dumber <laughs> as time has progressed. I don't know if the gamers are getting dumber, but the marketing people are sure trying to make it appear that way. Um, a good case in point is EverQuest 2 came out as a very complicated game that took a lot of uh, uh, smarts to play, a lot of things to learn, and step by step over its six-year history now, it's, it's definitely dumbed down. They're making it, quote, more open to other people, but it ruins the game doing that. I don't know that it's the gamers that are getting worse, it, but the, certainly the, the way they market it, market the game and the way they make their changes is very sad to see. You know, one thing I forgot to ask, I wanted to, to ask, but you know, I don't know how comfortable you are you know, with the topic, but I was wondering what you thought about Infocom and their... Um, when, you know, when they came out, it was very obvious that they, had a, uh, they were able to do things I couldn't do. They were targeting... Uh, disc-only machines while I was still targeting cassette in-memory and cartridge machines. Um, they were writing their work uh, on in-house mainframes, basically. I think they were using DEX um, while I was still doing all my development on the smaller computers. Uh, their payroll is probably six times what mine was. Um, there, there was no doubt that they were making wonderful games. Um, I played Zork. Once again, I played it when it was a mainframe game. I was out on the deck. I was once again at Stromberg Carlson, the original Zork, and I thought, "Oh, this is phenomenal." I'm not going to even attempt to try to make something like this for a micro. This isn't going to happen, at least not for a long time. Uh, when they brought out Zork on the Commodore 64, it was a disc-only game, and it was it was amazing that they were able to do that. And I realized, okay, this is certainly head and shoulders above my little two-word. Oh, uh, Ricky did efforts. I, 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 I could see that. And just to sort of wrap up here, I wanted to ask if you uh, thought there was any room left, or maybe there might be some new markets for uh, text adventures today. Um, probably as we get more into the smartphones, into the small PDAs, and uh, smaller devices that are a little bit more restrictive, there there can be. In general, interactive fiction is, is definitely more in a niche market now. There are definitely people that love playing it. Um, there's a lot of fan-written stuff going on, a lot of things happening, but it's not as big. Probably the last really, really big adventure games that made it was Myst, and that's you know that's way back there. But it was it was very popular and did very well. Um, it's it's hard to explain the game to people. It's like, oh, well, where are the pictures? Uh, what do I do? Uh, oh, this is boring. I, I, nah, never mind. Um, it, I think it's going to stay a niche market, but there are niches that it, it can still fit into. One of, one of the interview, you had mentioned something about a, a Lyme, chronic Lyme disease. My wife got uh, chronic Lyme disease about four years ago. Uh, we didn't know what it was. Uh, we didn't know the history of it. Up until that point, I was a firm believer that if doctors, that you go to the doctor, they give you a pill, they can fix anything. My eyes have been opened over the last four years. Um, I've helped my wife uh, get her chronic Lyme in remission. We don't say cured because if she stops what she's doing, it comes back. She's gotten her life back. A lot of people die from Lyme disease. A lot of people have Lyme disease. It's a very good chance you know somebody and your listeners know somebody who has Lyme's disease and don't even realize it. It can present as Alzheimer's. It can present as uh, ALS, as chronic fatigue syndrome, as fibromyalgia. All these could actually be chronic Lyme disease. I've got a website. Uh, it's called Lyme-resource.com. That's Lyme, L-Y-M-E, dash resource, R-E-S-O-U-R-C-E, dot com. And I have a free compilation of all the stuff I've learned over the last four years uh, helping my wife that I give to people. They can either download it there. It's about probably around 350 meg by now. Or I will send them a totally free CD in the mail with the information on it. And I also host a support group on the Internet. We've got, last I looked, over eight or 900 people that are signed up on it. All right. Thanks, Scott. 
really appreciate it. I think this will make some really interesting uh, stuff for the listeners and the viewers, too. Well, I appreciate being asked. It was a great honor to be on your show. The honor was all mine.